Greetings in the name of Jesus and welcome to everyone that's here. Appreciate having you here and in this worship service. Thankful to God that we can be here. Thank you for those thoughts, Wendell, especially as we think of the grace of God. We can be justified. His mercy, he saved us. We don't deserve it at all. It's such a blessing. Well, the Lord's laid on my heart this morning for a message. Uh, it's something that uh, stemmed from our devotional time the last number of weeks. We've been reading in Ezekiel, and, and that's a lot of things in there that I don't quite understand all the way through, but uh, it was a blessing to uh, especially come to this one portion that I'd like to talk about this morning or share with you what God has laid on our heart. You know, Ezekiel was one of the minor prophets, and of course, Isaiah was a major prophet, and Jeremiah followed him, and actually, as I looked it up and found that uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah overlapped to some extent, but there was a difference, and, and I'd like to bring that out. Jeremiah prophesied in the latter days of uh, Israel before Jerusalem fell hostage to the king of uh, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet, basically because if you read through there, he wept over and over because he prophesied to the children, and he asked, told them that God is displeased with you. You're living in sin. You're not doing what I'm asking you to do, and you're going to be destroyed if you continue. Just pleaded with the people, and, and they hated him. They didn't like the message he was giving. They had the confidence that Jerusalem would always stand. It was God's place where the temple was, and it will stay there. And, and here he's prophesying that it be demeased. It would not exist anymore. And so they hated him, put him in prison. They put him in a pit. They sent him to Egypt. They did many things to get rid of him. They wanted to kill him. Actually, when they put him in the prison, it was intended that he was going to die down there. But some merciful person brought him back out again. And thank God he did. But uh, he continued to prophesy until Jerusalem completely fell. But, you know, 11 years before Jerusalem fell or became overtaken, the temple was destroyed and burnt, the city was burnt, and so forth. 11 years before that happened, Nebuchadnezzar went into the Holy Land and uh, he exiled people. He took them and took them back to Babylon. That's where Daniel went back, and there were many others that went back. Many Jews went back to Babylon. He actually went through, and he, he was, they were supposed to take some of the people that were wise, that Nebuchadnezzar thought would be a, a boost to his kingdom. And, of course, Daniel was involved in that. And, but uh, Ezekiel also was taken, and Ezekiel became the prophet in the exile or to the exiled Jews in Babylon. So here we see that Ezekiel likewise continued to tell the Jews, look, you're being punished. God has brought this to pass. Change your ways. Um, do different. That's what God wants. He wants us, he wants a holy people, not one that does their own thing. You know, it's kind of like our day and age we're living in. People tell God how that we're supposed to live. And uh, this is acceptable, even though your word says it's not. And so we see a similar trend today. And, but there were those, the prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Lamentations was written by Jeremiah, and that's mostly just crying, pleading with God, pleading with the people. Uh, 
disappointments of not following God's ways, and that there will be a punishment, a day of reconciliation. And we also have a day of reconciliation coming, the end of time. And that end of time is when we die, or if he decides to return the second coming. Is it going to be a day of reconciliation? And as we have lived, so we will be judged by a righteous judge, God Almighty. Ezekiel lived, lived what he preached. He was obedient. He was asked of God to illustrate his messages with dramatic object lessons. And that's what's maybe a little bit confusing as we go through Ezekiel. But we notice that uh, some, I'll just name a few of those that are, there were many of them, really. But one of them was that he was to lay on his side for 390 days, during which he could only eat one-eighth ounce meal, one-eighth, no, an eight-ounce meal a day. Uh, that's not the scriptures that gives... Somebody figured that out, I guess. But it was, it was a meager meal is what it really was. It was almost nothing. And, and what that laying on the side was, it was telling, it was to be a demonstration that Jerusalem itself, those people, are, they're going to be surrounded and they will be, they couldn't get food is what it amounted to. They would be taken hostage. Then out of that came the exiled people that went to Babylon. And, but they were, if you read some of the history of what happened in Jerusalem before its destruction, that's what happened. There was much suffering of hunger, even to the place where they began to eat their own children. Terrible. Um, hard to believe. And yet... The hunger was that way. That's what he was to demonstrate physically by laying down 380 days on his side. Then there was an additional 40 days that he was to lay on the other side. And also another thing that was interesting there is that uh, that meal was to be cooked over manure. In other words, saying of how desperate the situation was. Another illustration that uh, we can read in Ezekiel, and that was the first one was you can read in chapter 4 of Ezekiel. And then another illustration was that he was to take and shave his head and beard off. It was supposed to be completely bald and, and took off his beard, which was, that was terrible for a Jew. That was ungodly in a sense. But it it, uh, and that's mentioned in chapter 5 of Ezekiel. And that talks about the destruction and the scattering of the people throughout the many lands. And of course, then some went to um, Babylon and others went in other directions. The, people, the children of Israel were scattered. And another thing that was in relation to that uh, being taken captive over in uh, Babylon Nebuchadnezzar also sent Babylonian people, leaders, over into the Judea area, and it was to integrate the people. He took them over into Babylon so that I could make them Babylonians. And he sent Babylonians over to Judah so that he could make them Babylonians in Judah. Integrate the people. Inter and, and if we read on in history, that's why the Samaritan, some of the result of the hatred between Jews and Samaritans in Jesus' time is because they had intermingled with the uh, heathen people and, and did not keep themselves as a separated people as God wanted them to be. But not all people did that. And we believe Daniel, was, Daniel and his three friends were an example of that, and Ezekiel was also. And there were many others that then again returned when that time came after the captivity that they returned back to Jerusalem and they had kept themselves pure. Can that be a lesson for us as we uh, go through an integrated people? We're in an integrated society. Are we accepting society upon us or are we remaining faithful to God and his word and standing 
steadfast, being an example of God's people. We also know this another thing that uh, was interesting. It says in chapter 24, he was, he was not supposed to show any sorrow when his wife died. That would be a very difficult situation. And that was to bring out the fact that God allowed the temple to be destroyed because they didn't repent. That very thing that was very precious to the Jews became destroyed. And they couldn't weep over it because they were gone. They weren't there. And so that demonstrated. He used vivid, natural illustrations to point out what some of the future things would be and what uh, was important to God. Trying to convince the people to return to God. God has punishments for things that uh, are not pleasing to him, and we will pay eventually unless we repent. But God is a forgiving God, and that's what's such a blessing. Like we just read the opening, and what uh, Gary had to say is, God forgives if we repent and turn to him. What a blessing that is. And we can demonstrate that by our forgiveness to one another as we... Um, go forth in daily lives, or are we going to carry grudges that will possibly destroy those whom we are holding the grudge against, and also it'll destroy us. Many of these illustrations typified the truths that would come to pass, such as in chapter 3, he asks to physically eat a scroll, which he did. Have you ever done that? Uh, but Ezekiel was asked to eat the scroll, and he did it. He obeyed. He was a man of obedience. But he says, it was sweet as honey. Now, how can that be? It's a miracle of God. That's, that's the way he is. That's the way God is. And he takes sour things and turns, if we're obedient, helps us to be obedient, and then he turns it into a blessing. We also notice that in chapter 317, Ezekiel was called to be a watchman. And a watchman is one who uh, preaches and demonstrates God's truth. Watchmen warn. And if you, there's another place in Isaiah where it talks about the watchman, and it talks about him, what he does. If a watchman is watching, he sees the enemy approach, and he doesn't warn he says it's the watchman's accountability. But if the watchman sees the enemy coming and he warns, and the people don't care, and they just go on, then it's their accountability. But the watchman needs to do his job, and that is to warn, to let it be known. A watchman could not sleep because something would maybe slip in. So you need to be awake. We, are we awake? When we, can we see when the enemy is coming and bringing in things that should not be, that are not according to the truth? And sound the warning and let others know so that I am not accountability and I don't want you to be accountability. So obey, teach, take that teaching and be obedient to it. Ezekiel prophesied to Israel and to the heathen in exile, he was teaching also, not just to the Jews, but he taught the people in, in uh, Babylon. Remember Daniel, and his three friends, different times where it spoke, his actions spoke to the king. God marvelously took a Daniel in the lion's den took an illustration that was very typically going to be death for Daniel, and in faith he trusted God. But the king seen that, and he was moved and glorified God, even to the heathen he preached. He followed and did the illustrations that God gave him to enhance the warnings. That was God's intention through Ezekiel and his prophecies. He had many specifics in his warnings, very technical, that 
Ezekiel followed. And today, we also have um, technical things that we need to um, take into consideration. We have a tendency to confuse. These illustrations have a tendency in Ezekiel to confuse a person, but it does bring us, show us that God is specific in his doings with us. And as we look in the New Testament, we notice that uh, Jesus said, not one jot or tittle will in no way pass from the law. A jot is a dotting of an I, we understand, and a tittle is the crossing of a T. So nothing, and Scripture tells us that there's not one word that's going to disappear from his word, from his law. God is the same today, yesterday, today, and will be in the future. It will uh, take place. Matthew five twelve says uh, Matthew five eighteen, and we also know in Revelation it tells us that not one proud person will enter into heaven. We're talking about specifics. Ezekiel concludes his book with a message of hope, even while they were slaves in a foreign land. That's where we would like to turn to this morning, and I have taken my title and also have uh, the portion of scripture to read. I have entitled the message this morning, How Deep Are You in the Water? So let's, if you have your Bibles and you want to, turn to Ezekiel 47. We'll be reading a number of verses there. First nine verses. Ezekiel 47, nine, uh, 47 reading one to nine. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Afterward he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he, then brought he me out of the way, of the gate northward, and led me about the way with out unto the utter gate by the way that looketh eastward, and behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits. In other words, he went out a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the ankles. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters were at the loins. Afterwards, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he said to me, Son of man, Hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. And when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and on the other. Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country and go down to the desert and go into the sea, which brought forth unto being brought forth into the sea, and the waters shall be healed. And it came to pass that everything that liveth and moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. Amen. That's as far as I've chosen to read in this portion of Scripture. <clears throat> But we notice in the very beginning there that um, it said, talked about the door of the house. Who and what is the house? The house is the temple of God. If we would read further back, we find that the house there is talking about God's temple coming out of the, and it talks about water coming out from under the door. The door is the source of where the blessings can be found. It's where God's word is available. The water of life is coming out from underneath the door there. 
a place of comfort and peace. It's a place of salvation to the lost. That's what it's representing. It's a place where God meets with mankind. All those things we find there in the first two verses is talking about salvation. And who would bring salvation? It's talking about the Messiah that's coming. There's a hope coming. And it's also possibly talking about the time which 70 years later, they were to return back to Jerusalem again to establish the kingdom of Israel. Uh, a new king would come in and that would come to pass. But it's giving hope to those who were in exile and hopelessness. Jerusalem hadn't come there yet, but there was a time coming 11 years later that there was going to be a complete destruction and Jerusalem would the walls would be down, the city would be burnt, and the temple would be destroyed, which they didn't think could happen. But God did that. And he shed no tears because they had not obeyed his truth. So God allowed it. <clears throat> the door faced to the east. That's interesting. Um, toward the Kidron Valley. And in the Kidron Valley is where you find Garden of Gethsemane. You'll also find uh, the Mount of Olives. Both of those places were almost dwelling places for Jesus. He was often in the Mount of Olives praying to his God. It's our Sunday school. We talked about that. His connection with God was vital. All night many times, out on the mountains sometimes, Maybe he was talking about the Mount of Olives. I don't know. But he says he was on the mount and prayed all night, many times, and in different other mountains. Maybe it was to get closer to God. I don't know. But it gives a resemblance of that. Do we get close to God? Do we connect? Do you, do I connect with God when I'm in prayer with him? Or do we find distractions sometimes? That's why I like the prayer closet and to close the door so that the distractions can't hinder my relationship with my communication with God. The road, of Bethany, uh, the road to Bethany also left from the Kidron Valley. That's where Jesus often prayed and met with his disciples and went down where Mary and Martha were and so forth at Bethany. Vine's definition of east is this. Vine's um, dictionary a rising of the sun and stars made to rise of Christ, of the day spring. And we feed, uh, see, find that day spring word found in the scriptures concerning the Messiah that would come and bringing the possibility of redemption and salvation for mankind that's lost. And then he goes on, he says, one through whom light came into the world, talking about Jesus, to dispel the darkness which was upon all nations, our sinful condition that was inherited at the beginning when Satan destroyed the perfection of God's creation, mankind. And, but God had an answer for us. We don't need to fear. We can come to him and receive forgiveness for those sins that are upon us. And that's what all these prophets were trying to do is to share with people that there is a better way than sin. Sin brings destruction and will bring damnation and will bring sorrow. It's darkness. It's all from Satan. And yet there can be a light at the end of the tunnel. And that's what the East foretells here. We also notice that the waters issued out from under the threshold it's demonstrating the emblem of the power of God's grace under the gospel. The gospel of Christ, which went forth from Jerusalem to spread into all the world. John 4.10 says, to the, uh, Jesus to the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus said, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given the living water. <clears throat> Natural man can't live without water. 
We will die very shortly. The spiritual man can't live without God's word, the spiritual water, that which Jesus and God has given through Jesus, revealed the truth to us. We need that living water. Revelation 22, 1, there in the last portion of the Bible, talking about uh, getting close to uh, or living righteous lives, demonstrating many things to John out on the Isle of Patmos. In Revelation 22, verse 1, he says, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, flowing out of the throne of God and the Lamb. Water coming out from under the door. John 7, 37 says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. The water is available. It's coming out. It's gushing. It's available. It's coming from another thought that we could bring forth as you read there in those first number of verses. The water come forth from under the door, but on the inside it come from under the right side of the altar. The altar is the place to meet God, where God is, represents God. On the right side, Jesus is standing after the crucifixion. He is at the right hand of God, demonstrating another thought of the right way to salvation. It's the water proceeded through Jesus on the right hand of the altar, coming through the door for us. Now there's another thought that we can gain through this portion of Scripture, and that's really what brought me to this message. Let's notice the progress of the gospel in the world and the process of the work of grace in the heart by the illustration that Ezekiel gave. We notice in verse 3, the waters, as they went out, those thousand fur lines, is that what it was? Thousand cubits. As he went out, those thousand cubits, Sarah, the water was to the ankles. You see that? Just to the ankles. Psalm 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. It's the beginning. It's walking with God, turning to God, repenting, and beginning the work. What a blessing. Beginning to have a relationship with God. It comes to the ankles. 1 Peter 2, verses 2 and 3 say, As newborn babes desire the milk, sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby, if you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Milk. It's that beginning. It's that starting off that's important. And it's that which blesses. If we have tasted that the Lord is gracious and we begin with him. And we also notice if we search the things of God, those things, some of the things are pretty easy. As we think of uh, maybe the scripture where it says, come unto me. All ye that are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Easy to understand. The water's to the ankles. It's there, and it's encouraging, and it draws us to him. Then in verse 4, we notice there was more progress, a deeper digging, a greater interest. Water's to the knees. In natural things, we become concerned if we see growth and God, and God is interested in our spiritual growth, spiritual health. God is interested. We have a small baby and it doesn't grow. Or we have a plant and we water it and it begins to grow and then it, all at once something happens. My wife looks for bugs to see if there's something causing it to be stunted. You know, we watch and we are careful. We want it to grow in natural things. God is interested in the same way. He's interested in our growth, growing. Spiritual health is important to him. 
because it's important to us. It's that which helps us stay on course. 1 Corinthians 4, 14, 20 says, Brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it? Be in malice be children, but in understanding be men. Deeper water. We, we search for greater things. We search and long for more understanding and to understand God. And we can't understand. There's never going to be a human that can fully understand God. But we can get closer, and we can get closer. We can grow. Someday, we won't be looking through a mirror darkly, as the Scripture says, but we'll see him face to face if we're faithful. And then we'll understand all things. How God can, he tells us, just one illustration of it's hard for man to understand God completely, but it tells us, and we know the earth is round, and we know there's people underneath and there's people on the side and up top, but it tells us that when he returns, every eye shall see him. How can that be? God. We don't understand God. I don't. But it'll be so. And great is our God. We honor him and we glorify him. Don't be children in understanding. Grow. Deeper water. John 5, 39 says, Search the scriptures, for in them ye shall have eternal life. Search. It's the key word there. Seek it out. And I believe if you have tasted of God, as we said there in 1 Peter 2, if we have tasted, we're going to have a hunger for some more. And we're going to search deeper and we'll dig deeper because we want and we'll be in deeper water. Then the last part of verse 4 talks about a greater progress. Waters to the loins as they went another thousand for loins. Er, cubits. Um, the deeper truths of the gospel. It'll be important to us. God reveals more and more to us. Hebrews 5, 14. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have, ex have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Exercise means to be continually doing. We work at it. We don't give up. We continue on. We keep searching. And we find answers. It's that which draws us closer to him. Waters to the loin. Another thought in relation to having waters to the loin and being deeper is to remain true and faithful to the Lord. Being grounded. Galatians 5.1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Stand fast means remain, be grounded, be faithful to the Lord. In the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. The liberty gives us a desire for greater things because it's that which rewards and another aspect of that waters to the lions is resist the devil and he will flee from you. It tells us that in the scriptures. We are to resist him. It's a steadfastness. When he comes to us, what did Jesus use when the devil tempted him after he came back from the desert for 40 days? And was tempted by the devil with food and different glories and so forth. Jesus confronted him with scripture. And that's a way we can resist him. By using scripture. Satan cannot stand against the word of God. He has to flee. Shall we use the resources we have? There's only one way we can. And that's when we know the scriptures. We need to search them and know what God wants. Then we notice in verse 5, a river that I could not cross over. Let's just read that. Afterward, he measured a thousand and the river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. Is this a discouragement to you? It's the end of the road. I can't go any further. Is that a discouragement to you? No, I don't think so. 
I think there's another lesson we can receive from that deep river that can't be crossed. What did it do for Job? When God showed to Job what he could do, his almightiness, can you make the cow calf out in the pasture? And he gave many illustrations that showed Job his undoneness before God. And what was Job's answer? He said, I am vile. I am nothing. When we become to the end of ourselves, we dig deep and we find ourselves and we see that God is almighty. We come to the end of ourselves and we say, I am vile. I need you. I reach out to you because you're the one who has the answers. <clears throat> There's another in Romans 11, 23 to 36, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him? And it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him, through him, and to him, are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. The greatness of God. We become undone and vile. Is there an answer for us when the river seems to be too deep for us? I believe there is. I'd like to turn. Let's see what Ephesians 3 has to tell us concerning that. I'd like to just read a few verses there in relation to our undoneness and who... And what can help us when the river becomes too deep? Ephesians 3, I'd like to begin reading, verses 16 through 19. There it says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, and the depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth all understanding, passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Faith, the secret of understanding God, trusting him, looking to him, finding our strength in him, believing that he is, that he will return again, and trusting in him. And that will help us to find the depth, being rooted and grounded in his love, allowing it to be a blessing in our lives. Then we notice that also... If the river is too deep, observe the workings of the past and take courage. We notice that he was instructed to go back to the brink or the bank. And what was there? There were trees there. They were flourishing. It was that which showed growth and blessing, things that had happened. So as we think the river is too deep, look back and see what God has done for you. Make it be the blessing to keep you encouraged and to continue on being faithful. Water to the lines, deeper water to where we can't even continue. We look back and we are strengthened because of the promises of God, because of the experience that we've had in the past, that which strengthens us. We reach forward to new strengths. <clears throat> Waters of healing, it says, are back there by the trees. That's what the waters do. They heal. They live. They cause the trees to live. Verse 9 says, For they shall be healed, and, every, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. In the last part of the verse there. That's where we find, or what we find 
and the water of life. The question comes, how deep are you in the water? Are you content with just ankle deep? Are you content with milk? Milk is good for the baby, but it's not that which will bring us into heaven. It's the beginning. We need to grow. We need to go forth deeper. Is ankle deep sufficient? I think of the parable of the vine in, in uh, Luke 15, John 15. Jesus said he want those that didn't bear any fruit, he cut off. But the branches that had fruit, he purged them or he cut off some things so that more energy could go into the fruit and, and that would produce more fruit. And then he went on and he said, even a third example of he wants us to bear much fruit. God expects growth. And that's what brings healing for ourselves and brings glory to him. Is my cup full and running over? Shall we kneel in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we commit this message to your hand. Speak to us that which you want us to be hearing this morning. May we learn from it. May we not be as those in Israel that refused and rejected and cast out the messenger, but help us to accept the word and let it become life to us. It was that way for those that were in exile. Eventually they were able to return back to Jerusalem and build it up again. Likewise, you forgive us and you help us start, turn a new page and draw an eye to thee. Help us, Lord, to forgive others too in the process, a working and a growing deeper and deeper in the waters. Share your truth with us this morning and help us to walk according to your will so that we can be prepared when that second coming comes for us, that we can be with you in glory and see you face to face and all hidden things shall be revealed even though you reveal some things through your Holy Spirit today. It's nothing to what you will reveal when we see you face to face. We give you praise and glory this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.